It's a geologist's pilgrimage of sorts to a place scientists explored then abandoned decades ago, nestled among the giant peaks of BC's coastal mountains. But it's coming up through the glacier, right? It's a very Canadian volcano that is uh, coming up through ice. But that's steam, not smoke. Yeah, it's, it's steam uh, coming from the ground, right. from the volcano underneath. The secret lying deep in the fiery belly of these icy peaks. There's energy there, infinite, renewable energy. Because this is actually a volcano. The glacier, melting due to a warming planet, is revealing huge holes spewing steam and noxious gases. That's another indication that there's power, geothermal power, to be harnessed. We're right in the crater of the last um, explosive uh, volcanic eruption in, in Canada 2,400 years ago. What does the fumarole tell you the, about the capacity of this mountain to provide geothermal energy? I mean, what this fumarole is, is it's just steam coming out of the earth, right? And so this is exactly the kind of stuff you want to look for when you're looking for, for geothermal resources. We're now in Squamish, a short drive from Vancouver. The small airport here serves as a gateway to BC's volcanic belt. Today is all about seeing the past, present and future of geothermal energy in Canada. Our guide is Steve Grasby, the government geologist who's leading the push to rediscover and develop the remarkable sustainable resource. And the first stop on our tour is an encounter with the past. Here we go. And it's going to be a helicopter. Uh, actually, my chest going to lift off the main airport. will be departing uh, runway uh, 33. We're heading to Mount Meager. The region's geothermal potential was first discovered at this site more than 40 years ago, pushed forward by a need for a new energy source. Prime Minister Clark said for the first time today, there may be oil shortages in some parts of Canada this winter. In the 1970s, the cost of gas skyrocketed due to conflict and revolution in the Middle East. People worried about filling up their tanks. Canada was worried about energy security. So Ottawa began pouring money into research on alternative energy, including geothermal. If you could tell me the story about when you first started to rediscover, for want of a better word, geothermal and the documents that you went looking for in that. So they had boxes and boxes and boxes of all the, all the information they had collected across the country over 10 years. And all the people involved were just found out overnight that this, this program is no longer running anymore. But, you know, they were passionate scientists and they just didn't want this all to vanish. So all the boxes got stuffed away in corners here and there and basements and garages and offices, and it was just a, a big, uh, you know, treasure hunt. The hunt led Grasby here to the original pumps installed to bring the underground superheated water to the surface. It's not an impressive sight, but none of this deterred Craig Dunn and his company from investing. I fell in love very much with the geothermal energy space because of the idea of drilling holes that, so to speak, didn't run out. So tapping into a resource that is renewable was an incredible opportunity uh, that I took on about 15 years ago. Geothermal isn't new. Other countries have been tapping into it for years to provide electricity and heat homes. Canada, though, is a laggard, at least until now. Dunn knows that because of climate change, there's a business case for this sustainable energy source. His company is planning to invest $250 million into the Mount Meager site by 2025. So prior to that, even more remote than it is today, is that we didn't have road access into this site. And from a resource perspective, amazing, but from a project development perspective, very challenging. As we see those change on this project, we see that the opportunity to come back to Meager made so much sense. That's a natural fracture system. Look, you can see it. It's not a clean cut. Even more exciting for these two geologists, though, is a box of rocks. It's a bonding moment most of us will never quite grasp. So we can see this is like a constant change between the different types of rock. Translation, these samples from deep underground prove the rock is porous and fractured, 
The water heated by magma from the volcano can then travel through the rock to the surface. We take the heat out of it, put the water back into the system, and over the course of time, it percolates through a hot rock, coming back to me as 260 degree water. There's another man there you'll notice. It's the chief of the Liwat First Nation, Dean Nelson. And this site is on his nation's traditional land, land never settled by a treaty. And then the whole solar facility on the backside. We wanted to do it this way, but we had to do it flat because the, uh, the snow comes up to like here. So we lose about a third of the solar panels. It's Chief uh, Nelson's course, first time awesome. here ever. So he's getting a glimpse of what he's only by. seen on paper or in photos. Being here finally on the ground is amazing. Like to, to have a say in what's happening here, to see what is proposed and you know what can be, I guess. But then getting all the power supply in here and in charge, I don't even know, did you walk around the back? No, I didn't yet. Okay. He and his people play a crucial role in this, and Craig knows it. So you own the rights, but you don't own the land, because you need their consent to go forward. Yes, absolutely. And I don't see consent as a need. I think of it as an opportunity. We have an opportunity here to show, you know, how we can work with the local First Nations to develop a green energy resource and have them actively involved in that process. Because ultimately, nothing moves forward without the First Nations blessing more or less a requirement to avoid messy lawsuits or confrontations on the site, unlike so much other resource extraction that's been carved out of Liwat territory for generations. We met Chief Nelson in his own community to talk more about what matters to him. I'm curious to know what, what, what people are telling you in the community about it. What is it in it for, for them? Like, how is it going to affect them? Like, is it, is it negative, like everything else that has happened over the years? Or, you know, are we looking at some positive things coming from this? Yeah, because it must be hard for people to trust. Yes, very, very hard. Because we've, like we said, we've been, we've been on the receiving end of the use of things, you know, watching them, watching industry progress through here without our participation or, you know, any kind of acknowledgement. So, and that, that's probably the biggest thing is having that, that doubt about, you know, that we're being taken again kind of thing. You know. The conversations continue between those who claim the land and those who want to profit from it. All the while, the science speeds ahead, driven by the same thirst for discovery that fueled their predecessors. Steve, can you tell me where we are right now and why we're here? Oh, sure. So we're standing on the flank of Mount Cayley, which is a volcano in, in the Garibaldi volcanic belt, it's called. And what we're looking here for is uh, the, the source of heat underneath the volcano. Why do you think there might be that geothermal heat under this mountain? Well, you know, I guess just being a volcano, that <laughs> is a good place to, to start. And I think, um, you know, it's partly just until you see it, it's hard to believe it. Now on year two of data collection here at Cayley, the next generation of geologists has inherited the methodical patience that science demands. This time though, amidst the world's growing quest for sustainable energy sources. The bigger picture tells the story of one critical piece of it, the hunt for the heat beneath our feet. Laura Lynch. CBC News, Mount Cayley, British Columbia.